Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. This is Jason Watt, and I'd like to take about 10 minutes here to go over a process that I think can help to ward off a problem that I see arise sometimes in financial planning engagements. And this is a common problem. I don't see very many financial planners who use this process. So I'm hoping people will find this useful and think about how they can apply this in their own practice. You can see we're working on a timeline here, working from left to right. So let's assume that we have a client who is healthy and has capacity. And the financial planner and the client have worked together and we have a financial plan. There's a formal financial planning engagement. We have a retirement plan, a long-term care plan. We've talked about investments and how they work for the client. We have an estate plan. Traditional elements of a financial plan. I know there's others, but those will be some of the key items here. The client being a good client goes to a lawyer to get their will and personal directive done. And along with that gets an enduring or springing power of attorney. Now we're gonna call that person the grantor at this point, the client becomes the grantor. That's the person who grants authority in a power of attorney document. So the power of attorney document is designed so that if, if this person loses capacity, there will be an attorney there who can step in and make financial and other types of administrative decisions for this person. You'll find that estate lawyers often do a really great job of this. And it's important that, of course, you have as good a relationship as possible with the lawyer that the client's using. But regardless of whether that happens or not, I think it's good to prepare your client. So think about this, that this is a, a client that you've worked with, that you've developed a relationship with, presumably somebody that you want to continue working with. If that person loses capacity, then the attorney is going to step in and it will be the attorney who is now making decisions on behalf of that client. Well, you really want that relationship to persist. I think giving the client some advice about how to name an attorney can be useful here. And there's some obvious stuff. It should be somebody that's gonna outlive that person or likely to outlive that person. It should be somebody organized and capable but it should also be somebody who shares values with that client, somebody who would solve problems the same way and deal with their family the same way. Somebody who has maybe some degree of familiarity with the client's financial plan and is comfortable carrying that financial plan out in the event of that loss of capacity. Okay, so now let's say that our grantor does lose capacity. And now we have to go through the assessment by medical professionals. And this is going to have to happen in term, in accordance with both provincial power of attorney legislation, as well as the terms of the power of attorney document. That person has now lost capacity. They don't understand the consequences of their actions. They're not capable of making decisions any longer. You still have that person as a client, but they can't make decisions. This is where the attorney is going to step in and instead of the client sitting across from you at the desk or on the Zoom call or whatever the case may be, it's now going to be you and the attorney sitting across from each other working through the client's financial plan. The attorney now has legal authority based on provincial power of attorney legislation, based on the terms of the power of attorney document and based on provincial trustee legislation. And there's a bunch of stuff that shows up here what can be done in terms of gifts? Are there any fees associated with the services provided? What about changing beneficiary designations? This stuff all varies quite a bit from one province to the next. The power of attorney document itself might give some amplification there. And generally we rely on provincial trustee legislation to determine how funds can be invested by an attorney. So here's what I see quite a bit of. I hear this problem regularly where client loses capacity, and two, three, four years later, the attorney who has a lot of responsibility here and has to act in the best interest of the grantor, the attorney uh, either makes a request of the financial planner that the financial planner is not comfortable with, that the financial planner doesn't think is in accordance with the terms of the financial plan, or doesn't think is in the client's best interests, or it might just be that the 
attorney decides that they want to do things differently and they're going to move to a different financial institution or it might be that they just don't legitimately understand their limitations as an attorney. And somewhere in here, we often run into some sort of a conflict between the attorney and the financial planner. And that's really what I want to address here. Here's what I would like to suggest, that rather than waiting to find out that there's a problem, be proactive right at the beginning and potentially even before anything goes wrong, before the client loses capacity. But definitely if the client loses capacity early on here, meet with the attorney, treat this almost like a new client onboarding process, which it isn't. You still have the same client, but go through the financial plan with the attorney. Say, look, here's the work that we've done so far. Here's the work I've done with your parent or your aunt or uncle. Make sure that the client recognizes, sorry, that the attorney recognizes that you've done a ton of work in the best interest of the client, that you do have a good understanding of what that person was trying to achieve. Now, I'm not going to suggest this is always going to head off any problems, but I think it can be a significant proactive step to help prevent those issues that come up down the road. And what I would like to suggest hand in hand with that is that you recommend at that point that the attorney meet with an estate lawyer. And there might be a cost to this, the estate lawyer might bill for this, but I think it's well worth it. Because what'll happen here is the attorney will now have an opportunity to have the right person. I don't think this should come from the financial planner, but rather the attorney will have the opportunity for the right person, that qualified estate lawyer, to go over the rights, responsibilities, and limitations that are imposed on the attorney. I'd like you to think about this the next time you are sitting down with a client and having a power of attorney conversation, or maybe you have a client who loses capacity in the near future or who has recently lost capacity. I think it's good to have a written process that says, this is how I do this when my client loses capacity. These are the exact steps I'm going to take. You know that way what you're going to review. You know that you're going to uh, meet with the attorney. There's a, a structure to it. And I think this can be a valuable bit of risk management. This can help to prevent problems for the client. This can help you to preserve that relationship. I hope you find this useful. I'm interested in hearing comments back. It's not a topic that I bring up very much in class. So if you want to make a comment about it, just in the comments below, or uh, you can email me or reach out to me uh, on Twitter or on LinkedIn or however you prefer. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you found this useful.